Hello and welcome back to The Independent Pianist. I'm your host, Cole Anderson. As always, feel free to check out the description box for timestamps if you want to skip my commentary and go straight to the performance. Today's video is my second night piece in a row. I just did Grieg's Nocturno a couple weeks back, uh, but it was very fun to do this. A very different kind of nocturne, but equally beautiful in its own way. Uh, this piece was suggested by a viewer, James Sabazitz. I hope I'm saying that correctly. But anyway, James suggested the six piano pieces by Respighi, which I've uh, been familiar with for a while, but I've never actually tried practicing them. So I'm starting with this one. It's the most famous of the set and quite an extraordinary piece. And I'll get through all six uh, in a little while. So thank you for that suggestion, James. Before we actually dive into the piece itself, it's worth noting a few uh, details about this. First of all, that this was Respighi's very first published composition. He was maybe 25 or 26 when it was first published. Uh, he had written the six pieces separately at various times, so it's not really a set in the strictest sense of the word. It's perfectly all right to split them up, and they show a wide range of styles and forms. So the first piece is kind of a suave, uh, ebullient kind of waltz, rather reminiscent of Johann Strauss II, more than anything else. The second piece is a canon, and it reminds me very, rather strongly of Grieg's canon from his lyric pieces. Uh, the third piece is this Nocturno, a very romantic and generous kind of piece. The fourth number is a minuet, which uh, is certainly in good company with other neoclassical minuets that were being written at that time. Uh, especially the one by Paderewski is maybe the one that I'm most reminded of. And then there is an etude, which almost could have been written by a Russian like Moskovsky or Lyapunov. And finally, an aria from Respighi's own opera, Reenzo, which uh, was premiered around the same time these pieces were published in 1905. So it is a smorgasbord, but a very pleasantly organized one, and really so typical of what you might expect from an extremely talented young person kind of testing their wings and their technique and experimenting with many different styles and compositional approaches. Along with this, the form of the Nocturne is also very free. He, he really made up a form just for this piece, and that's a pretty daring thing to do, also typical for a young person. There's no precedent, really. Uh, but the great thing is that it really works. You know, it just is an inspired bit of guesswork on Respighi's part. And actually, it's probably not fair to call it guesswork because although it sounds like a free improvisation, it's actually very well organized uh, in a somewhat loose way, but there's, there's a logical underpinning to this piece. When I started looking at this piece really carefully, I was very surprised to the extent that there is in fact a motivic structure which is underlying this piece. So if you listen to this opening accompaniment motive, it's an ostinato that continues throughout the piece, uh, you'll hear that there is a descending line in this accompaniment. There's three descending notes which I've circled. So these three descending notes are basically at the speed of a dotted quarter for each note. Then we hear something a little bit similar. It's kind of subtle, uh, greatly sped up, three descending 16th notes that occur in the melody. And I wouldn't be surprised if you were kind of looking at me askance at this point yeah, and saying, well, this is probably just coincidence. And it could be coincidence, but the next occurrence of this is I think not coincidence. We hear this again in the second phrase, but this time it's at the eighth note speed, but the same kind of figuration with three descending notes. unmistakable that there is some kind of connection. Uh, later on, Respighi inverts this motive also for the next phrase. So there is this kind of motivic underpinning, and as I said, the form of the overall piece is very free. You could kind of call it a ternary form, 
an ABA, and that's what I've written in the analysis that accompanies the performance. But the proportions are all really unusual. The first A section is very long. We get three long phrases and a transition. And then the B section is quite short, as is the last A section. So we get a first phrase in seven bars. All the phrase lengths are kind of uneven, which also contributes to the improvised sound. Uh, and this first phrase has an ostinato, as I was saying. It also has a pedal point. It's a, a G-flat pedal point underlying it. And then there's a second phrase, which is kind of an answer to the first, and that one is in the related minor, E-flat minor. And it's actually quite contrasting in its outline, but it does rhyme with the first phrase, so meaning that the ending of each phrase is very similar. there's another long phrase. This is a variant of the second phrase, this time moving to another new key, D flat major. And then there's a wonderful passage in which he starts to modulate towards F minor. So I've marked this as a transition in the video. And then we finally get something which is melodically and rhythmically very, very different. We get to the, the real B section. If you're hearing orchestral sounds, you'll probably hear brass and sustained strings here. Notice also that this idea is in duple meter, so instead of having triplets like the rest of the piece, it's very clearly uh, divided into groups of two. So this section, as I said, is actually very short, uh, it's very dramatic, and it's really a kind of free cadenza-like passage. So just to define this term, for those of you who don't know it, uh, a cadenza would originally have been in a concerto with a soloist and orchestra, and towards the end of the first movement, the orchestra would stop playing, and the soloist would play by themselves some kind of very flashy solo passage. So that's what's really going on here, it's really in that style. This sort of a passage would usually be free rhythmically and would have all kinds of brilliant scales and arpeggios and the like. So this particular cadenza ends with a really striking scale, that last really fast scale that you hear twice. Uh, let's hear it a little slower, I want to zoom in on that. All right, so at this point in the video, I am going to get into a little bit of theory double speak. So if you feel your eyes glazing over, just skip forward to the performance. Uh, but for those of you who are interested in this stuff, you might have noticed that, uh, strictly speaking, this scale contains all the notes of the D flat minor harmonic scale. Uh, the only problem is that we are nowhere near being in D flat minor. Uh, at this point, we are really in A flat minor, and in the left hand, we have a half diminished seventh chord on uh, E flat half diminished seventh chord, and this is acting as a substitute for the dominant of A flat minor. So shortly, Respighi is going to change A flat minor into A flat dominant seven and use that to get us back to the home key. So this is already kind of unusual, substituting a regular dominant chord with a half diminished seventh chord. And now that we know we're in A flat minor, let's uh, play the scale starting with A flat. So this is actually a mode of the harmonic minor scale, and 
Uh, if you're into these sort of things, like modes, uh, you'll notice that it's almost like a Phrygian scale. The only difference is that the Phrygian scale would have a regular whole step from uh, B double flat to C flat. Here we have an augmented second, B double flat to C. And believe it or not, there's actually a name for the scale. It's called the Phrygian Dominant Scale. And it's, it's very common in traditional music from all over the world. It's found prominently in flamenco music from Spain, uh, Arabic and Egyptian music, klezmer, Indian raga. And you even hear it in some classical music, European classical music, towards the end of the 19th century. And I don't think it's an accident that Respighi uses it here because there's a famous use of this scale in another night piece by a very prominent predecessor to Respighi. Of course, that's Frederick Chopin. At the end of Chopin's B major nocturne, opus 62, number one, in a slightly more subtle way, Chopin uses this exact scale. So although Respighi makes something completely unique of it in his, in his composition and combines it with even more daring harmonic treatment, he is being inspired here by Chopin, and that was probably his model in trying to create this nocturne. Which I think it's, it's a wonderful balance that he struck, though, between modeling this piece on a famous predecessor and creating something that was very much unique to himself. Uh, so after that, there's not much more to talk about in the piece. There's a very short recap of the A section, a very lovely coda. Uh, this coda actually has another cadenza kind of balancing the big first one, but this cadenza is very thoughtful and reflective, but you should definitely play it in a very free way. So thanks for watching this video. Please stay tuned. I have the complete performance with the analysis coming up next. Uh, please consider supporting the channel as well if you can. An easy way to do that is www.patreon.com forward slash independent pianist. You can sign up to make monthly pledges that really help me to continue bringing you this content. You can also help me though by just liking the video, subscribing, and watching every week. I post every Friday. Uh, if you would like to hear me live, you can uh, book me for live concerts. I like to give concerts with a lecture component to them. So uh, just drop me a line at cole at independentpianist.com if you want to book me for something like that. I also teach lessons online too, so if you're looking to take your playing to the next level, uh, just drop me a line at that same address, cole at independentpianist.com. So thanks again for watching and see you next week.